welcome back, everyone. It's day three of the Digital Disruptors Week. Join us as we soldier on to the next session entitled The Business and Investment in Esports. Hmm. Moderating this session is Mohamed Faro Anupata, Director of Communications, Malaysia Electronic Sports Federation and Content Creator, Sea Gamer Mall. Faro is also known as Flava, is constantly engaged as a professional e-sportscaster, host, MC, speaker, and moderator in Malaysia and the Southeast Asian region in events such as the World Electronic Sports Games Southeast Asia 2018 and 2019 by Alibaba Esports and Acrimine, Malaysia Cyber Games, just to name a few. With that, I pass it to my fellow host and friend, Faro. All right. A very good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to our conference here today. And hopefully all you speakers, everyone can actually hear me, right? All right. We can hear okay. you. All right. So welcome to Creative Tech Summit Esports Conference in conjunction with the Malaysia Tech Month by Malaysia Digital Economy Corporation or AMDAG. My name is Flava. And for our first segment for today, we'll be talking on a topic um, called Business and Investments in Esports. And I've been given the privilege to actually invite uh, three amazing guests to actually join us for this segment. Of. And, you know, in most cases, when a moderate, they say, say three amazing guests, in most cases, they lie just to make, you know, just to make the segment more fun. But uh, trust me on this, like, they are amazing, all right? Like, first of all, I would like to, uh, first, our first speaker for today, we have, Mr. Frank A. Sliuka, is it correct? Is that is that a correct pronunciation? Mr. Frank A. Sliuka, S L I. Perfect. You Perfect. All right. I'm, I'm doing good. Much better. Perfect. Much much better than himself, right here. No. Right. <laughs> Mr. Frank is joining us. He is none other chief operating officer of ePolls. Joining us for today, Mr. Frank. Thank you so much for joining us, and it is truly an honor to actually have you join us because um, I think uh, I think. Uh, I think this is our first time joining in together in a segment uh, for our two panelists, especially the other two panelists who actually been together in uh, a few conferences before. But I think this is my first time together with yourself, right? So welcome. And thank you for joining us. Thank you. All right. And our second speaker for today, we have Mr. Adrian Gafour, all right? This Chief Executive Officer and a show board member of Esports uh, Business Network, EBN, all right? Adrian Gafour, welcome. Thanks for thanks for having me here. It's gonna right. be a fun session. And so happens to be the only panel today that actually he didn't want to use the original background that our our organizing team provided. So just to ensure that we didn't we didn't felt so sad about that, he ensured that his background was like half EBN and half MTM. And so thank you so much for that. And uh, of course, third and not least, our final speaker, third speaker for the day, is none other than the CEO of One Esports, Mr. Carlos Alimur himself. All right, Mr. Carlos, thank you so much for joining. I believe also uh, this is actually the second time before this, we actually had a conference together, and it is great to actually see you joining us for this segment. And I believe that all three speakers that we have today is able to actually give. A uh, huge insight to the topic at hand. All right, so let's not um, waste any more time. Let's jump into it. Speakers, are you ready? Adrian? Yes. Yes. Frank Carlos. All right. Great. Well, all right. So first of all, first question to the floor is right. Uh, would you mind sharing a little bit about your background before starting a business in esports? Anyone? Anyone? Feel free. Sir. Yeah, I mean, I'll start. I'll start. Um, so before joining One Esports as CEO about two years ago, I uh, was the chief commercial officer of another esports startup called Battlefy. I was there for about four years. Battlefy is the world's largest yeah. online esports competition platform. Yeah. But I think the more interesting story as it relates to the panel is before uh, joining Battlefy, I worked at a very, very big media company in the United States, a company called Univision which is the largest uh, Spanish language media company in the United States, serving over 70 million Hispanic Americans. And my last role there was corporate development, looking for investments. And one of the uh, companies that I was exploring was essentially Battlefy. And that talks a little bit about my transition from going from kind of my earlier career, which was in management consulting and consumer electronics and traditional media, and how I professionally got into esports. It, it was really my corporate venturing days that got me exposed to the business uh, essentially seven years ago. Interesting. All right. So Adrian, I suppose. 
Yeah, so um, my background prior to esports was in advertising and marketing. Um, so I was in New Zealand, um, studied marketing and advertising, graduated there, worked there for an advertising agency called Shine, um, did quite a few pretty awesome clients, came back to Malaysia here uh, for a holiday. That was about 10, 11 years ago now. Um, joined a company called Gray Worldwide here in Malaysia. Now it's rebranded to Geometry, um, handled everything from... Um, British American Tobacco, all the way down to FMCG. Uh, left that, um, joined a little startup at that point in time called Saves.com. Not, not so small anymore because now they're known as Ref Media Group. Um, and then um, after the their first acquisition, I jumped out, got the startup bug, and I was like, hey, let's, let's jump into an industry um, that we can kind of build and grow, right, um, from ground up. And that, that industry happened to be esports. Um, started an esports marketing company called uh, The Gaming Company. And um, now we've got um, a really, really big group called Esports Business Network um, and and about five or six companies below it. And the esports marketing agency is part of it. It's been a fantastic journey so far. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So Frank, is, yeah. <laughs> I really can't remember my life before esports. <laughs> <laughs> It's, it's so long ago, but uh, no, I am originally coming from, from the convention <clears throat> and exhibition uh, industry. So I was, when I was uh, based in, in, in Germany back, uh, I think, 20 years, I was responsible for the business strategy of one of the biggest uh, convention centers in, in Germany to attract new industries uh, to, to run uh, exhibitions in Germany. One was household appliances. This was not so interesting for me. But then we came up with consumer electronics and games. So before I, I started in esports and gaming, I will come from the convention and exhibition area. Right. Now, now here's the thing. It's apparent that all our panelists here have amazing portfolios before going to esports, right? I really want to reshape this question. I really want to ask, like, what are you doing here in the esports ecosystem? Like, what brought you from there where you were before into doing business here in esports. So the question is like, what potential did you see within the esports industry that others didn't, I guess, yeah. You know, you know maybe I'll start. I, um, and again, I'll, I'll go back to a little bit of my own personal history. So before I w worked at Univision, I worked at LG Electronics and I ran strategy for their North America business. And that, essentially every single quarter got me into, got me visiting Korea, you know, because I had to visit LG Electronics. And this was like in the mid kind of 2000s. And I, it was there that I kind of saw like esports like totally kind of take off. Like, you know, there were, you know, esports athletes on billboards and, and all of this stuff. And um, at the time, I, I will admit to you, even though I, I, I was a lifelong gamer, and followed a lot of the, you know, followed um, StarCraft and, and League of Legends and things like that. I, at that time, thought that was kind of a decidedly a Korean thing. I, I was like, you know, conformist society, you know, high broadband penetration. Um, that, you know, that's never going to take off in the United States, you know. Um, then when I joined Univision, they had their own uh, research team that um, basically said that Hispanic Americans, and, and for those of you who may not be familiar with the United States, Hispanic Americans are the, by far the biggest ethnic group, um, minority group in the, in the country. Um, uh, the research had indicated that Hispanic Americans way over indexed on gaming. And so I I, that kind of triggered something in my head. I was like, wait, like this thing happening in Korea Maybe like there is a chance for this thing to, to, to go broader than just Korea and China. Um, and then, you know, we, we know what kind of happened with things like Twitch really blowing up the spot and, and giving a, a, a platform for people to talk and, and celebrate esports. Um, but that was one of the one of the things that really got me compelled to join esports and, and, and at the time Battlefy. Because not only was I passionate about the space as just my own hobby, but because I kind of saw um, early on, I had the benefit of seeing what was happening in Korea and then seeing a kind of the, 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 uh, the small green sprouts of, of esports in the United States in, in kind of the early mid 2000s that really kind of made it a compelling option. And then 
to answer your question even more specifically, how, like how did you get into esports here, here, like in this part of the world? Um, you know, I had, you know, completed four years at Battlefy. I had an amazing run there, still have an incredible relationship with the company. Um, but then when one championship decided to get into esports with their joint, with, in, a, in a joint venture with Dentsu, and they were looking for a CEO to run the business, I was lucky enough to really be really the only person on the list, to be totally frank. I mean, they were looking for someone who was not 20 years old, someone who was in esports, someone who had startup experience, and someone who had previously actually lived and worked in Singapore. And I, and, and I, and I did that. And like, I, I lived in Singapore in 1999 and 2000. So kind of the running joke was like, there was only one person they could have picked. And, and, and I was lucky enough to be that person. Um, but all joking aside, one of the things that I um, really saw and has, you know, and I think we'll talk about it, has come to fruition in this part of the world is Southeast Asia is on the vanguard of mobile esports. And there, you know, if you think about the rare opportunity to even be in esports, which is kind of a creation of a whole entire, entire phenomena, but then also be part of the paradigm shift from PC console to mobile, it's happening in this part of the world. And so it's in a very exciting place uh, to be involved in esports, primarily because mobile is so dominant here. Wow, that is amazing. And I just want to say, it sounded as if you yourself were the one who actually wrote the requirements to actually be part yeah, of well, yeah. itself. Well, I'm sure we'll talk about how to get a job in esports. And that's one of the things you need to do is you need to kind of create the role sometimes. Oh, I, that That is great. All right. Thank you so much, Carla. So Frank, Adrian, maybe you would want to share. Yes, of course. Um, yeah, I think it, it starts every time or often with the need and I was uh, 22 years ago, I was responsible for a big consumer electronic show and in Germany that wanted to add games to <clears throat> their portfolio. But at that time, the games industry in Germany don't want to join this uh, big event. They wanted to do their own show. What later was games convention in Leipzig and now, now uh, Gamescom where I was involved <clears throat> over a long years as a strategic uh, advisor and uh, advisory board member. Uh, but at that time, <clears throat> my duty was to bring the games industry. So, and I don't want to fail. So I thought, okay, what should I do? I, I, I need them. The industry don't want, the publishers don't want, the dev developers don't want, and did some research. And I'm sorry to say this, I found these kids and they, they played competitive games on a platform. And they said, what, what they are doing? And I was so fascinated about what they are doing. I said, okay, I have to bring them to a show. And if I bring these events to a show, um, I have a part of GameSense, the GameSense, because they play games, and then the publisher will be there, even maybe only small. So we did this, and this was the first esports event on a, and in 2001, um, at an exhibition. So and you, you can imagine what, what, what is uh, happening now. We have a lot of events doing all our big uh, games industry events. So this was really the first one. And I was so fascinated about what these <clears throat> kids uh, did. And so I said, okay, I have to be in, in this industry and help them to, to establish esports. We started first with Germany. So, <clears throat> and um, then it goes more and more international. And, um, so these young guys, this was the ESL guys, by the way. So uh, Reicher, Jens Silgers, uh, all these. And this was really a lot of fun to work with them and to establish esports more and more. Um, so yeah, this was, was my step into it. Um, Carlos brought it up, why Southeast Asia? I'm originally from Germany. Um, I saw <clears throat> uh, the same what, what Carlos said. The opportunities here in Southeast Asia, and may I can add some some value to to the industry, and may add some value to companies going in this region and to grow the the industry. And I think there are huge opportunities, especially with, with mobile esports, but also with <clears throat> engaging with communities, growing communities, or even establish games and uh, yeah, so help the entire industry to to grow here in this this region. 
Great, great. All right, so Adrian? Yeah, so I think how, how I kind of came into the esports industry was um, coming from a marketing and advertising background, I think um, you always look for new and innovative ways for, for brands to kind of strategize, reach new consumers, um, new target markets, the younger generation. And I think one thing that we really landed on after I left Says and created a brand agency first was what is something new and exciting that brand can latch on to that, that hasn't quite exploded in the market yet? And how can we then take that as a new marketing channel for brands? Um, survey the industry, of course, we landed on gaming first, right? Um, and then eventually esports. And what we found was that the, the intensity of the community at that point in time, this was back in, in 2014, 15, was just incredible, right? Um, not, not many communities are built with that much passion as what esports communities have. And to be able to, to bring brands, connect them, create new opportunities for the community, um, driving brands into the community as that platform that can serve both communities and brands, that's something that really got me interested, got my partners interested at that point in time. And then from there, we were thinking, look, what's, what's the best kind of model to bring um, from a business perspective as well as from a community perspective? How do we help the community grow, establish themselves and continue to, to expand? And how do we then bring brands in and utilize this as a marketing channel, right? Um, that's something that we were really focused on. We landed on... Um, an esports agency model, right? So taking Leo Burnett, taking a gray, taking something that I'm very familiar with by nature, slapping on esports, right? And saying, hey, look, let's let's figure out a, a beneficial way to build both sides of the industry, the commercial part, as well as the community part, right? That's kind of that first step in. And the minute, you know, I think you go into the industry, you start to absorb and learn so much that, that, you just want to continuously keep growing it. I think that's the common sentiment across Frank and Carlos as well, right? The, the minute you come in, it's just, there's so many things that you can develop, so many things that you can do, so many opportunities that exist. And how do you then kind of bring that to fruition for everybody collectively? All right, interesting. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Now, going on to our next question, I just want to highlight that each of you enter esports at different times, right? So I think like Carlos, uh, I mean, uh, uh, let, let's count one esports, right? I think if you're joining, uh, joining, how recent is one esports? Was it like in 20? Yeah, so, yeah, so the, the joint venture between one championship and Dentsu was announced late 2018, like I think, I believe November. Um, and then I joined as CEO in June of essentially, let's call it July of 2019. Um, so I've been here for about two years now. Yeah. So it's been around, I, I think everybody joined in esports at different times. Like, was there, uh, when you start making a move into the esports industry, was it considered as the right time? Or did you felt like, was there a specific reason why you entered esports during that? Because let's start with this. Adrian, when he started off in esports, uh, I believe the first opening thing he did in 2014, 2015 was he actually did like a huge esports event, all right, as his first uh, project right here. So so did you have like a game plan for this or you just jumped in and felt like you know, without really a plan per se? Yeah. Um, so good question. I, I think... You know, what I will tell you is when I joined Battle 5, because that's really kind of my first entry into esports uh, seven years ago, you know, I was 38 years old. And so, and I was deep into my tradition, in, into my media career. And, I, and, and frankly, I was quite, se I was a quite senior executive at, at one of the biggest media companies in the country. People were worried about me. People thought I was having like a midlife crisis, you know, and, and frankly, maybe I was, you, you know what I mean? Like, um, but to be 38, to, um, to, to already be successful in a, in a great career um, in New York City, and then to leave that all of a sudden to join not only just the startup, and by the way, when I joined Battlefy, it had seven months of cash left. It had zero dollars in revenue and was literally only serving like 15,000 players, okay? And so the fact that I was leaving a great career to go join a startup, not only just do a startup, but also in a space where people are like, 
what's esports? And, and remember, during this time, like even ESPN, like at the time, the CEO of ESPN was calling esports not even a sport and was like degrading it as as a pastime, right? So yeah, people thought I was bananas, um, but you know there were a few things which I think some of us have touched on. One is I, I was deeply passionate about the space anyway. I I was a gamer and I loved gaming, but the other thing was. I had witnessed the energy and the passion and the enthusiasm when I visited Korea. And um, one of the other things which I didn't mention, which which I'll speak to now, because I, it was also a big motivator for me, was if you if you kind of think about one of the big changes that's happened in media, just just in media in general, or even in in culture, and and what is determined as cool. 20, 20 years ago. It was the United States pretty much that was dictating what was cool and what um, other global teenagers consumed and, and bought, right? But if you now go to Los Angeles, New York, Chicago, or, or any other big city in the United States or any big city in Europe, what are you going to find on a weekend? First thing is everyone's drinking bubble tea or green tea. What are people watching on Netflix? K-pop. What are people watching? Anime. What are people, you know, like, like what now, what is cool now globally st has started in Asia. And so 20 years ago, it was the West dictating what was cool and culturally relevant. Like we're in a different paradigm now, right? And that was a, a little bit of what got me, gave me a little bit more courage because I, I, at the time saw this huge shift in what is being culturally relevant. Um, and so that, that was one thing that um, really motivated me and gave me the courage and confidence to do it. But dude, like seven years ago, people thought I was like bananas for, for doing what I did. All right. Yeah. So I suppose, um, Adrian, you need to take on this um, because you didn't start. You didn't start small, all right? You were, I mean, how, how do I phrase it, right? I don't think you were ever in the esports industry. So what went through your mind jumping into esports and creating um, MES? Yeah, back in 2014, 2015, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think when it comes to like, is there a right time to come into esports? I think, uh, and I'm going to use um, one of our very good friends, I think Chris Tran's um, quote that he brought up at a conference that I was at in Singapore with him. Um, he basically said that esports is like this, this jet plane that's taken off and that's moving at a million miles an hour. And the industry makers are, are, are continuously trying to upgrade it, like changing the wings while it's in the air, changing the seats, dumping it out the plane, you know, ch changing the exterior. So it, it's an ever moving giant, right? Um, when, when we first came into the scene, um, we were like, hey, look, we come from an events background. Let's, let's dump and do a massive esports event, which, which failed like, like horribly, right? <laughs> but um, the one core thing that we actually took out of that was, look, um, at that point in time, we were the first um, global event to be held in, in Malaysia, right? And we overreached, right? Um, but we took a lot of lessons from that. And I think the entire industry did and started to build off that, right? Um, that That's something which I'll never shy away from. It's taking the failures that that we've had as a company and personally myself. And how do we then re-innovate that to create a, a stronger future for the community, for esports, for our business? Right. Um, how do we take those learnings and really push that forward? And I think that over the years, we've done a tremendous job. My partners, the, the team that's been with us from the very start, um, that's that's something that I'm very, very proud of. Right. So whenever someone asks me, oh, dude, what happened to all these events? I'm like, let me tell you a bedtime story. Right. Three hours <laughs> later, <laughs> I've gone through the entire issues of it, but I've also gone through. We learned so much from it and we we wouldn't be as strong as we are today if it wasn't for all of the things that that kind of went wrong at the start. Right. That's something that that I'm always going to be very grateful for. It's like reading 100 books in 30 minutes. Right. <laughs> Uh, that, that's interesting insights right here. So I guess next I will go with Frank. I, I believe that ePulse, uh, the platform itself was actually established in 2015. Like I believe during that time itself, there's already uh, a number of platforms being built during the same time as well, right? So 
uh, like, did you felt like it was the right time to actually have this, or did you felt like you felt like doing it right there and then? Yeah, I think with this with my history and um, when I started esports and uh, from from what I said earlier, I was fascinated what these young people are doing. At that point, I also saw the business opportunities back uh, 18, 18, 19 years ago. And <clears throat> what what we started was to 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 first in Germany to create a, a structure. So this association, this B two B conferences, this uh, this uh, new events, what what, what comes up, um, <clears throat> and establish them within the games industry, and then go more international. So we work with, with the, the Koreans to establish. Um, yeah, ISF, for example, um, and, and, and grow, grow it more and more. Um, <clears throat> but I think what at this time was missing was, was really platforms that can serve um, the, the purposes of esports and, uh, of course, enable uh, engagement with, with clients and uh, give, give more <clears throat> business opportunities. Um, ePulse, I think they, they started in, in 2015, uh, really <clears throat> uh, three brothers. Um, they they didn't find any platform that was suitable for that at this time. I'm sorry for for Battlefire for that, but for their their purpose, they didn't find this is suitable. And they said, okay, we have to develop something. What serve the the, the players' uh, behavior and attitude and what they want to achieve. And one of the founders, um, he spent fifteen thousand hours of marketing research in Dota two. So he was in the top 100 of the Dota 2 from, from the player side. And he, he really uh, realized what is needed. And so they, they brought it into the business. And this is uh, one reason why, why ePorts may did it in a different way than other platforms. <clears throat> and they, they focused on, on, on one game first to grow it. But <clears throat> I think especially with, with Battlefly and other platforms, this was one of the basic to grow the entire esports business. And now we have another opportunity with uh, mobile esports. So I think these are um, <clears throat> so some, some steps. So I really had, was, was very lucky to, to get different, let's say, waves and the up and downs of the industry, what, what I saw. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to see that since uh, 2017, 2018, the industry is only growing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. I really, really want to touch on the topics on your platform, but we will get into that really in a bit. All right. Yeah, but before no, no, that, no, this, yeah, this is this is fine. But um, <clears throat> I think this was was uh, years ago. It was really an interesting time to see how you can structure that and how we we are were able to establish the esports as a topic within the community. And then the, the population, but also on the uh, politi uh, politics side, with uh, politic parties, um, we we had a lot of interaction with the the um, Games Industry Association in Germany, and that helps a lot then to spread it out to Europe and then um, globally. So <clears throat> it was a really um, very interesting side time to to shape the industry. All right, thank you very much. Now, gentlemen, um, I discovered this uh, interview which actually happened in called Fair Game with Christian Leahy, where Mark Cuban, the billionaire, actually mentioned that owning an esports team in the United States is an awful business, all right? So this is what Mark Cuban said. And, and being in Asia, there's money. Now, how much of this is true? And if it is, is that why you gentlemen are right here in Asia doing business in esports? Oh, I just I just want to add one thing. Since Carlos has been doing business in the United States, probably he can address like is is it really bad in the United States when it comes to esports? Well, you know, well the first thing is is man, it's really hard to to ask someone, hey, are you willing to contradict Mark Cuban? Um, but uh, <laughs> but but I but I will try. <laughs> to, to do yeah. Look, there um, the United States is an incredibly competitive sports and entertainment market. I mean, like, if you think about the, the, the sports properties that exist in the United States, dude, you got Major League Baseball, NBA, NFL, NHL. It, 
on a typical weekend or any day of the of the week, you're going to have professional sports in the United States, right? Yeah. And so when Mark Cuban makes a statement like that, what he's essentially saying is, hey, like esports really needs to totally take off and, and go big and or be in investment mode for a very long time if you're going to go up against the NBA or the NFL for, for the attention of people, right? Now, one of the things that um, I, I think does make uh, this part of the world attractive for esports is, you know, you don't have an NBA here. You don't have a Bundesliga. You don't have an English Premier League, you know? Um, and so there is this opportunity for esports to really grow and take over. Now, the other thing that makes the United States different than, than this part of the world is this part of the world is a lot younger, too. Right. And so while in the States, not only is it competitive because you have these big, huge sport media gorillas in there, it's also an aging demo. Uh, also, Europe is the same thing. Right. So people are already ingrained in their habits. Every Sunday, they're going to watch the NFL. Every Monday, they're going to watch Monday Night Football. You know, um, now here in this part of the world, you got a lot of young people. They haven't formed habits yet. They haven't been totally massively loyal to brands. And there's space for esports to grow, right? And so I, I think that's what Mark Cuban is saying around um, the opportunity in Asia and esports. Now, the, the other thing I would say, which Mark Cuban, I, and I remember this um, interview that he was talking about. And, you know, one of the things that he was mentioning in the rest of that interview was unlike in traditional sports where an athlete can be like Michael Jordan, how long was his career? Tom Brady, how long was his career? Messi, Ronaldo, those guys have been uh, playing football for, for many years now. In esports, a, a problem that we do have is that the professional lifespan of a player is a lot shorter. And what, what kind of Mark was talking about was when you have short kind of lifespans like that as an athlete, it, it, it's hard to create the, uh, the momentum to get brands really involved. Now, one of the things that we try to do at One Esports is to really emphasize and celebrate and share the stories of esports heroes, right? And because this is what's going to, frankly, enable those athletes and enable our industry to, to frankly, monetize better. Because, you know, one of the examples I use all the time is if you asked my mom, hey, mom, like, tell me three rules about basketball, she would be clueless. But if you asked my mom, hey, name for me a famous bas basketball player, she'll be like Michael Jordan, right? Now, why is that, right? Now, if we, when, so when we think about esports and we think about growing the pie, growing the ecosystem for everybody, we believe one of the, the key ingredients there is celebrating and sharing those stories because that's how you get a wider tent. That's how you get more people involved. Because let's face it, it it's not easy to understand what's going on on an esports live stream. You know, it, it can be very yeah. complicated. So the storytelling and the celebrating of the esports athletes and, and, and humanizing who the players are, I think is a massively important thing that we need to do as an industry. And that what and one of the things that One Esports is really focused on. Yeah, I think wow. we should jump in here and discuss that with, with Carlos as well on the build up that point is, is the other aspect of the industry is, is at, at every life cycle when it comes to the growth of esports teams, esports businesses, so on and so forth, there, there, there tends to be different ways to, to build a business model, right? Um, from teams to agencies to media companies, so on and so forth, right? Um, and, and, at this point in time, I, I really do feel that people are starting to look at the industry as a whole, looking at the ecosystem and going, look, how, how do we really build solid um, monetization streams, revenue streams within, within our companies to do with esports, right? Um, coming from a community-driven industry, right, um, to put that commercialization on top of it is going to take a lot of time. And I think over the last 
10 to 15 years, that monetization and business model has heavily evolved, right? From, from teams coming up and going to get, pulling together their monies at the start and then pulling in a couple of sponsors and having prize pools that core, core revenue source of earnings, they've now diversified at multiple different layers, right? From talents, from, from streaming revenue, content revenue, so on and so forth. Even the way you can monetize from a brand, from a team perspective is, is immensely evolved, right? From just slapping logos on to now developing and distributing uh, customized pieces of content, so on and so forth, right? Like what Carlos mentioned before as well, when it comes to extending the lifeline of a player. And I think um, over the past 10 years, we've seen teams that stay together for one tournament and break up. Now they're staying together for a longer duration of time which shows the whole evolution that a team can survive, team members can stay within it. And, and then brands can start to find that, that attachment that they can now invest and build and it won't go to waste, right? Um, previously, it was after one tournament, poof, that team disappears, right? Uh, five individuals go and create new teams and next time the tournament comes around, you see five different teams participating, right? Um, but it goes to show that from a business perspective, I think now is a time where you're going to be able to see a lot of businesses re-innovate themselves, a lot of teams, a lot of companies to find more sustainable ways of, of, of accepting investments to generate that ROI for investors, right, for, for what is to come in esports. Yeah, I mean, just to piggyback on what Adrian said, I think um, in traditional stick and ball sports, there's been so much emphasis on the player, Michael Jordan, Messi, Ronaldo, you know, you know, um, Serena Williams. Well, individual sports, obviously it's focused on one person, but on team sports. I think one of the uh, real recent, recent being like last two to three years, which esports teams have really kind of latched onto is building the brand in the story of the team. Like what, what does the team brand mean, you know? And so instead of, you know, selling Derek Jeter, they're selling the Yankees is kind of the exact, I'm sorry for the American uh, analogy there, but, um, you know, really building the, the team brand and as a lifestyle brand. And this is just one example of how it's evolved over time uh, to make the business um, way more su sustainable, at least from a, an esports team perspective. Um, to, to add something on, on that, and I don't want to uh, challenge Mark Corbin, but, um, I, I don't see a lot of uh, sports clubs, especially in the NBA, they are really financially successful. So I think there's maybe something something else behind it. But um, what I see, with, especially with esports teams, is they, they offer an, uh, a business career, even what, what sports clubs are not really doing for now. Um, it's a former player can go as a content creator or a streamer within the club. And this is where you can create this universe, what, what <clears throat> Carlos said, you, you create a brand, a lifestyle brand. So you have maybe more steps for, uh, for, for players to stay with the club or with the team to, to get into different, let's say, professions or business within the community of the club. It's, I think for, for me, it's a little bit of a difference. And I think from my perspective, I'm, I'm not so involved in, in Esports teams, but I think esports team can learn a lot from the sports club and sorry to say it to make it better. All right. Thank you so much, gentlemen. Uh, let me just keep a note here to submit this responses to Mark Cuban. A number of people are disagreeing here. All right. So thank you so much, gentlemen. Yeah, this are this are great responses right here. And um yeah, jumping on to the next one, I, I have a question. First, I would like to start off with, with Mr. Frank, right? Mr. Frank, um, your business, uh, ePauls, is a platform, all right? And compared to other platforms available in the market, yours is a little bit different. You, you start off being focused on Dota 2, and now you have Counter-Strike Global Offensive, CSGO, as well as Valorant. But if you were to compare your platform with other platforms available on the market, most of them would actually have even more game titles available on the platform itself. Is, so is this uh, business model you're running with just three game titles working for you? Or is there a specific reason why you're doing this for ePulse? Yeah, for us, it's a business model and luckily for our investors as well. So we, we, we just got some months ago <clears throat> the CSA funding. 
uh, what puts, of course, pressure to the business model and to the team. But it shows us that we are on the right way. And maybe it's different. Um, first of all, we are looking to the grassroots. Second one, we want to enable esports for our <clears throat> community, for our partners. And then the third one is uh, think global, act local. If you're following this, and I have 25 different games on the platform, what's it's great, and maybe 2 million users. And if I then divided these million users to the numbers of games I have at the platform, and then I look into the regions or even in countries, then my percentage is very, very small. So I can't really serve uh, our partners if we are talking about grassroots, and this is our business um, in, a, in, a, in a very good way. So for us, it's important that we can <clears throat> work with, let's say, one game and the community very well. We are very well connected and in several countries or regions to the community. So we can exactly uh, serve our, our partners in the best way. And in, in, in these areas there are regions they want to go. Um, and for, for our investors, and they, they agree to it, they say, OK, this company, we can scale it massively. One, we can add every next game. So there's a scalability. And the second one is we can scale it in every region. So we showed this with Dota, now we with Counter-Strike, um, yeah, Valorant. But yes, there are more and more games into the platform, but we want to do it in the right way, very data-driven, so we know our clients very well, we know our regions very well. And this is what, what the partners and the community, by the way, it's not only for the partners, for the community, um, what they really like and um, appreciate what we are doing for them. So this is a little bit different, but as I said, we know the communities where we know what they want. And so we can connect and enable communities with brands and uh, games. Mm -hmm. And but, talk, yeah, okay. Sorry, sorry. But what I said, it's, it's, it's different. It's a, we are focusing mostly on grassroots on the digital uh, <clears throat> business. Maybe in the future, if the, the world is open, then we may go in and into live events. But for now, our core business is really only digital. Mm -hmm. I understand. Now, on that point itself, like how did you choose the game titles to be featured in your platform? I mean, like beyond Dota 2, CS Guns Valorant, there's a lot of games available on the market. We have League of Legends, we have um, Call of Duty, uh, we have Hearthstone, we have a lot of esports game titles. How, how were these three game titles chosen specifically for your uh, platform and how's that for business so dota 2 if even let's say it's an oversaturated market it's a proof business model it works and yes uh, we, we we hope that dota 2 will existing in 20 years uh, but we know that some games are very popular than uh, if we have starcraft so you can't really as in the business you can't really rely on one one game of course so you have to add at more, but we do our market research. So where we think um, <clears throat> where are the best communities in, 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 in markets, they have value in terms of spending of the community. So for our business, so where there's a lot of spendings, we are active communities. And then we look, okay, which, which games are uh, popular in this market? And um, for us, it's at the moment a very classic, um, uh, Esports title, as I said, all of the approved business system, uh, models, but also Valorant uh, has, uh, if you're looking to the data, um, it's uh, very, very interesting from the growth of the community, the interest, every data behind that. And um, in this region, of course, there are mobile esports, it's interesting, um, and then to go into it, but we do this very, very carefully to see how we can serve communities and our partners in the best way. Um, so that's a little bit how, how we're doing this. But once we make a decision on the game, there's a lot of data behind it so that we do the right steps. Understandable. Uh, can, can I just simply say that it is much more manageable this way rather than having too many esports game titles within the platform itself? Uh, yes, of course, it depends on the size of, of, of your team. Of course, if you have dedicated teams to, to games and you can grow it massively. But as I said, for us, it's more important to, to serve communities in the right and the best way. And from the perspective of the community, the users, but also for our partners. 
and this was was the 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 the, the, the most important reason for us to focus on on only some games. And for now, from 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 the business side, um, we did it. I think in, in a very very good way. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Frank. Uh, next one, I have questions for Mr. Adrian Gafour. All right. So I think Adrian, um, your portfolio, you, uh, you're working together with EBN, but EBN itself as a whole is a big portfolio. Can you give us a breakdown of what EBN is? Yeah, sure. So the, the eSports Business Network in a nutshell is, is um, it's a group of eSports marketing focused companies, right? Um, we've got TGC, which is the gaming company, which is a, a turnkey uh, 360 eSports uh, marketing agency, right? Uh, the end-to-end -end from brand strategy to planning all the way down to the execution, um, as well as the implementation of branded campaigns. And ultimately, what we want to do is to bring brands into eSports. Right. We've got Prime Live as company number two. It's a talent management company um, specifically designed to, to kind of bridge talents with brands and vice versa. Um, Orange Esports Cafes is probably the oldest business. Um, we've been around for about 18 years. Um, it's the largest esports cafe business in Malaysia at this point in time. Um, Orange Esports is a team organization um, that that is, uh, was established in 2011, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and then we've got the uh, EBN Esports City, which is a 65,000 square feet um, esports facility, right? We've got a thousand capacity esports arena inside. We've got um, fully equipped green screen studios to host any virtual live broadcasting uh, venues, as well as um, our own uh, EBN HQ situated in that space. And that, that's in the heart of KL. And um, we've got Liho as well that joined the family, I think, early this year. Um, it's part of our innovation strategy to rebuild and reform our esports cafes when we push forward with the future generation, right? There's always been this taboo with, with esports cafes in the past, right? Like the minute you mention that, it's like, hey, you've... You're going to fail your studies, get kicked out of school, you know, stop, stop going there, right? So what we want to re-innovate it to become in the future is this youth hub where you can go and grab a cup of coffee. It's a cafe, but at the same time, there are gaming machines that you can also go and play in, right? Um, so everything that we do here has has a brand focused mindset, right? From point of sale, from touch points with Orange Esports Cafes, with the EBN Esports City, um, all the way down to uh, the more digital touch points that our marketing agency, TGC, uh, Prime Life with the influencers, Orange Esports as a team, as a talent management house can also combat, right? Um, ultimately, what we wanna do is to be able to craft uh, brand strategies that, that reach an arms and a length um, away from on ground to to the digital world. Um, hey, I think you're on mute. My apologies, my apologies. <laughs> All right, so we just wanna talk a little bit about uh, the themes that you're working together with. Uh, starting off with the gaming company, together with Prime Life, Orange Esports Cafe, Orange Esports Team Organization, EBN Esports City, Leho, Borneo Gaming Company, like, what is it that you're looking for as far as companies are concerned when it comes to working together? Because I know it's not as easy as ABC to find a, a working partner, and especially when you're working, like even finding one company to, to work together with is, is not an easy feat, but you're joining quite a number of businesses together right here. No, I think it's about finding that 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 core objective that everyone is in line with, right? Uh, talking from a company standpoint or from a group standpoint, I think what we want to be able to establish is a group of companies that all drive towards the same vision, right? Is to build that that ultimate esports marketing ecosystem for brands and advertisers to latch onto, right? So everything that fits within our centralized vision is going to be that that partner that we do want to work with, right? Uh, one esports we have worked with you guys. On quite a number of occasions, right? Uh, even with ePulse, we've actually worked with you guys on home ground activations for Orange Esports as well. So ultimately, what we want to do is, from a brand perspective, we want to serve as that platform that connects brands with the community, right? And that community can be community companies, community cup, uh, partners, so on and so forth. And then vice versa, as we want to be able to provide that that complete ecosystem that that startups can latch onto and that can leverage offers at the same time, right? So ultimately, we're beneficially building that industry, 
right? And everything goes towards how much value can we drive back to the community when it comes to um, hosting tournaments, when it comes to influencers, when it comes to revenue entering the industry to increase that pile, like what Carlos mentioned before, I think it's a very important play for us here in Southeast Asia, right? And from a talent perspective, I think that um, on top of qualifications, so on and so forth, like a lot of people come and say, hey, I don't have qualifications for esports, right? But here's the thing, right? How do you get a qualification in esports at this point in time, <laughs> right? There is no concrete uh, ground rules that says that you need ABCDEFG to be able to be part of the esports industry. So I think for us, when we're looking for for solid team members or new 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 uh, people to join the family, I think it's really about the attitude. It's about the grit that someone has to come into a growing industry and to take it by the horns and just continue building it with us. It's going to be it's not a walk in the park. It's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of research. It's hits a lot of rapid growth personally, as well as within the industry to, to help boost it up. And I think that that ultimately for me and for us as a group that trumps everything. It's about the attitude, the enthusiasm, the amount of grit that you have um, to be able to survive in the industry. Awesome. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Eric, for, and of course, uh, Mr. Carlos, I do have some questions for you on this. Now, everybody knows that before one esports started, everyone knows the one championship all right which is which the brand is mostly related to mixed martial arts muay thai and kickboxing which was formed all the way back in 2011 so the first question is what is one championship doing here in esports you know because you, you told us a story about like oh they were looking for somebody to actually work on esports but what was one championship really thinking when they want to expand into esports Tell us, buddy. You're on mute. Sorry. Um, great question. So there's really two um, things that um, provided the impetus. The first one was uh, the fact. Of the the fact is is that the overwhelming majority of the fans of martial arts in this part of the world are already Gen Z and millennials. And so if you're already speaking to Gen Z and millennials you know there's just going to be a natural overlap with gaming and esports. So, and that's what they found. So one was that just from a sheer audience perspective, there was an overlap there, which, and, and certainly expects they, we believe and which came true, is that there was this unfair advantage in getting to esports because we already had this heavily Gen Z and millennial audience that, and, and because of that, they were already on mobile. Right. So that was one thing that I think was a, a business insight that gave the courage and the confidence to get in. The second is, um, you know, Japan has an incredible heritage in game development, but it's very emerging in esports. And so to be able to do an esports joint venture with a company like Dentsu, which is like the best big brother you would ever possibly want to, to try to get into Japan for esports was another huge kind of thing that kind of drove the decision forward. And then the third, um, which was around our assets and capabilities. You know, if you look at what one championship has done in martial arts versus, let's say, um, their Western counterparts, one championship has always been focused on the story of the athletes of the struggle, of the discipline, of, of humanizing who these uh, competitors are. And, you know, when I um, was talking to One Championship about becoming CEO of One Esports, that was one thing from an assets and capabilities perspective that I really latched onto because in general, I think as an industry, we can do so much better in telling the stories of our esports heroes and esports athletes, you know, and it, it goes back to my story around my mom and Michael Jordan. Like she knows Michael Jordan, even though she doesn't know anything about basketball. It's the same exact thing, right? So, you know, when when we think about one esports, th that is very much why our mission um, is to share and celebrate the stories of esports heroes who ignite the world with strength, hope, dreams, and inspiration. Um, and so that that were the those were the few uh, things that really drove one championship to get into one esports. Wow. Okay, that's an interesting story. Now, I, I think second is like I think fans do expect since one championship expand to one esports, people do expect will there be one day where one esports will create an esports tournament that would integrate having one championship inside together. 
Yeah. Um, the, sh the short of it is we have entertained that, but as you can imagine, it's really hard to take a martial arts setup and then convert it into an esports setup. I mean, like, uh, that, that's going to be very, very difficult. But what I will say is uh, before COVID, um, in Japan, in Tokyo, we held a fan festival that included um, martial arts on one side. And then on the other side, we did Street Fighter and Tekken, right? And so there is definitely opportunities to cross those over. Um, right for now, where we really share um, uh, with one championship is really in the values and in the storytelling. And that, I think, is the glue, the adhesive that keeps uh, both of the businesses really tied together. And then obviously, you know, we share, we share an, a, kind of a similar audience. As I said, they're all Gen Z and millennial if, if you're watching martial arts and esports. All right. Uh, now, One Championship is huge as an organization, and we do expect huge things from One Esports itself, all right? So what can we expect from One Esports when it comes to international level esports events? Because, before you respond to this, because, because in esports itself, every esports game title has uh, its own big events. For example, like Dota, we have the majors, we have the international, we have the minors. Even for League of Legends, we have the worlds and all that. Uh, and I do understand One Esports already hold the majors Singapore, um, so congrats for that. And so what can we expect? Will One Esports have its own world-class esports tournament in the future? Yeah, an interesting question because I would have answered we already do. Um, and, 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 you know, you already said it. I mean, we've, we've held, the, we held the Dota 2 Major in April, which generated more than a quarter billion views. Uh, before that, we did a Dota 2 Invitational, which essentially had the same teams in it. And we're going to have another big event next year. And then for all the events that we run now, I mean, they're pretty huge. Uh, you know, like, you know, we're running uh, the Mobile Legends Pro League Invitational. That's massive. We, we've done a lot of competitions with Activision Blizzard, for Call of Duty Warzone. Um, you know, we actually are the official international media partner for LPL, which is the Chinese Pro League for League of Legends. And so, you know, one of the things that um, we agreed very early on about One Esports is um, this is going to have global ambitions and we're going to start um, globally. And, and we have, I mean, with all the big Dota 2 events that we've had, and you should expect us to continue to be marching forward on this. Um, it, kind of an interesting factoid is when you look at um, the audience for oneesports.gg, which is our own and operated website, um, which is already in the world ranked fifth, primarily because we're localized in, in all the relevant languages in this part of the world. Um, the, uh, depending on the month, the United States is either third or fourth uh, in terms of um, a source of traffic. So, you know, our, our, um, our potential and our ability to scale um, beyond Southeast Asia is already happening. All right, thank you so much, gentlemen. Now, I we do have some questions coming in from uh, the audience who is actually currently watching the live stream we have today. And one of the questions is, what sort of percentage of ROI range can an investor look at, uh, esports investment to look at, yeah? Um, um, this is, this is very hard to say. It really depends on the deal and yeah what, what uh, esports venture you have. It's a platform or a team. So it's really, really hard to say yeah, it and which you. stage the company is uh, in like terms of investment cycle. Yeah, I mean, totally agree. With it's a, it's a very situational uh, thing, sorry. Yeah, I, I totally agree with Frank. What stage is the company? What, where in the value chain are they playing? How experienced is the management team? What games are they involved with? Because different game developers have different levels of, uh, let's call it authority in, in what happens. So there are a lot of different um, uh, things that are involved in, when you think about ROI. Now, what I will say is, as I mentioned to you before, I was in the corporate venturing space, right? So what were some of the things that I was thinking about when I looked at a company like Battlefy? First thing I looked at was, do I trust the management team? And, and not, not only just tr trust in terms of like, are they gonna do, not, not only obviously, are they gonna be good people and do the right thing? What I mean by trust the management team is, are they smart? Like, oh, oh, do, do they have the experience? Do they have the capabilities to run an actual business? Um, 
in gaming, there are a lot of passionate people, but I don't know how many of those passionate people are like shrewd business people, right? So that's the first thing that I would say to any investor here, which is look, number one thing probably is the quality of the management team, um, even more than the idea. The second is um, uh, to really understand that any investment in esports is going to be a multi-year journey. And um, if anyone is promising like immediate like returns, I would be skeptical. I mean, because this, I believe this is, you are in the you know, first few stages of this industry. Um, so you got to be, you got to have a real strategic mindset when getting into this space. Those are my kind of my two biggest of advice um, when, when thinking about investments in, in esports. All right. So uh, I do apologize that we're actually running out of time, but I think I just want to squeeze in one more question. My apologies to MDEC with this, right? I have one question. This is a marketing and advertising industry who intends to venture into the Singapore marketing esports industry. Sorry, I, you broke up there. Oh, sorry, sorry. apologies. Um, what, would you, what would your advice be to someone from a digital and marketing advertising industry who intends to venture into the Singapore marketing esports industry? Yeah, so let, let me broadly answer this question because um, I, I'm increasingly, and, and it's great because now that esports is blowing up and people are interested in it, there are a lot of experienced people who are trying to get in, into esports, whether it be, you know, the, you know, so I get a lot of resumes with and, and CVs from people who, who are uh, coming from a lot of big brands, got great experience. And the most important question that they got to answer is show me how you, how your interest in esports has manifested itself. And you'd be surprised how many experienced people have come to me saying that, hey, they're looking for a job in esports, but they have no proof points in how they've been involved in esports. Were they a moderator on a Twitch channel? Did they even go to a platform like Battlefy and start up an online competition? Have they even responded to you know tw uh, Reddit channels that are talking about esports or gaming? You know, there are all these simple. Have you started a podcast? You know what's so a little bit ironic is that we live in a world where so much technology has democratized, has been democratized and it enables you to be involved in emerging spaces. And yet there are a few people who take advantage of them. And so my biggest advice for people who are experienced, who wanna get into this space, put the time in. As Adrian said, you gotta put the time in, put the grit, show the grit, and do things like be a Twitch moderator, start up an online esports competition, respond, you know, participate in the Reddit channels, get involved in, in Twitch chats, get involved in the discussions that are happening in LinkedIn about esports. I mean, there's all these things that you could be doing to show that you're that hey, you might be, you know, an experienced person who doesn't have professional esports experience, but at least shows that you're involved and that you're interested. Those are the things that we really look for, particularly for experienced hires. Show me the proof point. I agree with that. And just to latch on with, with Carlos, it's all about which part of the value chain do you see yourselves fitting in, right? Esports has an industry so big. Uh, marketing and advertising as an industry is so broad already. So when you come in, which part of the value chain do you want yourself as an individual to fit in or your company to fit in? Right. And then you can slowly start building that your business model around that because esports is so diversified that the minute you don't have clarity in your business structure or model or objective, you start to sway around in the industry and you, you end up with not a very favorable outcome when it comes to progress. Awesome. All right, gentlemen, I just uh, want to say thank you so much for all your insights on the topic of business investments in esports. Thank you so much, Mr. Frank, Ace Luca, thank you so much to Carlos Almurang, and of course, Mr. Adrian Gafour for joining us for this segment. I, I'm glad <laughs> that we jumped straight to the to the, uh, to the topic because we didn't have enough time. We do have a few more questions left. Unfortunately, to respect our next segment itself, we have to cut it short right here. So once again, thank you so much, gentlemen, for joining us for this segment. And I would like to pass it back to our MC. Ms. Hasrul, to continue back. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.
Flavor. Thank you, everyone. All right. Wow. Thank you to our international panelists for that amazing, eye-opening uh, discussion. Esport. One hour is definitely not enough. So now we're moving out to the uh, next session of the day. It will begin very, very shortly. Click join session and we'll please uh, get you to complete the survey for us to con uh, continuously serve you better. Okay. So we'll see you in a bit for our next session.